Father, we do just lift up this time and ask that you would bless it, Lord, that it would be a time where we can grow in our understanding of who you are and, and Lord, just fall more in love with you. So I do pray that you would have your hand on everyone in here tonight. It's not just me teaching, but it's us finding things out. So bless this time, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, who's going to be first? We got one over here. Okay, so I have a question. Esau traded his birthright with Jacob for a bowl of red lentils, and then Jacob stole Esau's blessing. What is the difference between the birthright and a blessing? I don't think there's any difference. I think Jacob connived and stole it by doing the whole lentil soup thing. So I don't think there's a difference. There's just the same event called two different ways. So I think that's what we're looking at at Scripture because of what Jacob, Jacob uh, was kind of a conniver. Have you ever wondered how God could love Jacob? You know, people get upset where it says, Esau I hated, Jacob I loved, and I'm thinking... Well, how could you love Jacob? So anyway, so uh, I, think that's, I think that's all that is. Good question, though. Yes? And the song that we were just singing, it says, let the earth rejoice. Is that the, literally the earth or the people of the earth? Or could you explain that a little better to me? Oh, where it says, where, uh, in, in which psalm is that? The song that we were just singing. Oh, the song we just sang. Yeah, okay, well, I think in that, when we're singing that, we're talking about the, not just the planet Earth, I think we're talking about us. All of us rejoice with the Lord in what he's doing. So, I, does that clarify it? Okay. And uh, Job 42, 14, um, the blessing that he gets after um, Christ, or the, the God blesses him, are seven children, or yeah, seven children, seven boys and three girls. Could you tell me why the three girls are named and they were beautiful? There is no, um, let's say, uh, lineage given from women other than men in the Bible, except these here. There's three women mentioned. Yeah, Job. Job 42, when it talks about the girls? Yes, yeah, they're, they're the only ones that are mentioned. The only ones that are, are mentioned. Are the girls. Are the girls, yeah. None of the, the men are mentioned as part of the lineage. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why that's that way. Probably because people get mad because they don't mention girls. So God thought in Job he would mention girls and not guys. I don't, I don't know, Jim. That's a good question, good observation. But I have no idea why that's like that. Sorry. I'd love to give you some great story, but... Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Pastor. Um, I, I was under the uh, understanding that there was only one showbread table, but then I was reading in Second Chronicles chapter 4, verse 19, and it said, um, the Solomon had all the furnishings made for the house of God, the altar of gold, and the tables on which was the showbread. Can you clear up my question? Please? Man, you guys are deep readers. You guys are finding stuff that... Uh, I don't know why it's plural there, because my understanding is there's a table of showbread. So maybe in case one got dirty, they needed a spare. I mean... I'm making stuff up here. <laughs> you guys are asking hard questions. Like, I didn't really want you to read your Bibles. I just wanted you to go. <laughs> uh, I, 
I don't have an answer for that one either. Sorry. I'm striking out tonight. Maybe we shouldn't do a QA. and a I mean, I'm not very good at this. So I, I, don't, I don't know why. I, I'll try and find that one I think I can find. It might be just something in the original language. Yes? I have a question. Uh, several times in the New Testament, there is reference to after this will be the judgment. And it's not really talking about the great white throne judgment. So is that a judgment for us once we get to heaven? Is there some kind of a judgment? There's a, in the New Testament, and, and especially in Second uh, Corinthians, it talks about the Bema seat. That's a judgment that we all go before. And it's not a judgment unto condemnation. It's a judgment for what we've done with what he's given us. And it's more of a rewards than a judgment. It's more of a reward ceremony than a judgment. They just use the same word. Okay. So, but it's more, it's more, here's what you get for what you've done. Okay, that makes sense. I, I didn't think Yeah, that, we, we will not be judged that's under condemnation. It's under the blood, so what's to right. judge? <laughs> but it's for what we've done here, for what we've done with what he's given us and how we've used the talents, you know, this story of the talents. So, yeah. okay? Thank you. Yes, I got one. <laughs> one for three. <laughs> Hi, Pastor Pat. I'm sure you'll be able to answer mine too. But I was reading in Judges 2, 1. Thank you, Mom. It says, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bokim, I'm probably saying that wrong, and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land. I swore to give you to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So if it's I, my question was, I thought that would be God who led them out of Egypt. But when it started with the angel of the Lord, but it's quote, unquote, I brought you out, wouldn't that just the angel, God? yeah, in that passage, the angel of the Lord would probably be what we call a theophany, which is an appearance of God putting on human form or an angelic form and speaking to the people. So it is God speaking as the angel. Notice it says, angel of the Lord, all in caps. I'm in the NIV. So oh, well, that's angel a problem. is yeah. capitalized. <laughs> it's not the right one. I have to switch it then. My Bible's so it's, it's, it's what's called a theophany. So God is appearing to them in the form of an angel, and then he's speaking to them. Okay. So it is God speaking. Thank you. That's two. Good job. Okay, we have someone over here, and we have someone over here. Point okay. to Gaynell, okay, point to uh, Matthew. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I have a question. I was reading in Revelation in chapter 14, verse 9, and it's talking about the mark of the beast. And I like to do the split screen in the, um, the um, online version so I can look at different versions of the Bible. <clears throat> and in the New King James it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. But when I look at the New King James, it says on his forehead, on his hand. And NIV also says on. But I just find it interesting that King James, it was in. So I always had envisioned, okay, people are going to walk around with these 666 is on their forehead or on their hands or something. But this kind of alludes to the fact that in the King James Version, it's going to be something in us. Yeah, what, what chapter was that? Um, chapter 14, <coughs> verse 9. So, uh, I would say, I mean... I don't know why the King James would say in, uh -huh. but I do th think it's a definite mark mm -hmm. of the beast. I think uh, you'll have to take that mark to buy and sell. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's something that you're going to be tricked into. Okay. I think it's a definite, you will know you're taking the mark. It's mm -hmm. not going to be, oh, no, I did this, now I have the mark of the beast. 
I believe it's going to be very obvious. You're going to make a definite choice. Yes, I'm siding with this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to take that mark. So exactly what it is, we're not sure. But I don't think it's something... I don't think it's something you can be tricked into and fooled into. Mm -hmm. You know, like today, some people look at different things. Is this the mark of the beast? Is this the mark of the beast? And I don't think it's going to be like that. Plus, Mm -hmm. the mark of the beast doesn't come till during the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. And I believe the church will be gone then. So, but I hope that helps. But I don't know, I don't know why the King James would say in. Okay. I'm not good with scriptures because I don't remember which scriptures. And um, I already forgot. (laughs) That's bad. Okay, I'm back to the 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 mark of the devil. Um, (laughs) This is really bad, but um, my son, I named him Damien, and that was before the movie Omen came out. Six six six, the mark of the devil. And um, so you can't go by that per se because my son is not the devil. He is really a good man. And um, so the mark of the devil, I think, is, is a, a um, society thing. It's not a, a biblical thing. I think that is, is totally society. But, um, shoot, I'm sorry, I have issues up here, and I forgot what, <laughs> what was the subject before, the, the, the mark of the beast. It was the angel of the Lord. I'm sorry, I forgot, but I just want to, I, I remember the mark of the beast, but the mark of the beast is what we perceive it to be. And you should never take it as what society puts it on. It's what the Bible says. And it's not the 666. um, Because if it is, don't call me because my phone number is (laughs) 520-266-18. Yeah, you can block me because 666 is in it as a joke. So anyway, I'm sorry. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> all right so i was reading job which i've read a lot because i love job um but in the bible it talks about and it he talks about how all of his blessings multiply at the end after he you know mm-hmm. obeys um but it seems like his kids it's the same amount that he gets again if i read right and i mean i don't know like i thought about it and like maybe he's talking about in heaven like he's, his kids will multiply, like he'll have the ones in heaven also. But it talks about how his sons, you know, sinned against God and cursed them in their heart. So, like, well, he lost his sons and then he got he got a new family back, and that's the blessing. Oh, okay, that's a multiplication in the blessing. blessing. It didn't mean didn't mean he was going to get m- more. It meant he got them. He got a new family. Okay, okay? Right. that helped. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, good. No, that's good. Okay, wait back here one. How are you doing, Pastor Pat? Um, so the question I have is, what is the like main differences between different churches, like where it's like a Lutheran, uh, non-Protestant, Protestant, Orthodox? Um, is there like a difference in like teaching Christianity with the churches, or are they all kind of like come in together? I think there are more the big differences in how people worship. So some people, in in some of the churches you mentioned, are what's called high church. Okay. So, like, they're more formal in what they do, and they're more formal the way they worship, and the way their, their uh, services are more liturgical. Do you, do you understand that word? They're more organized according to a liturgy and go down that way. Uh, some churches like us, we're considered low church. Not, not that we're like, <laughs> but because we're informal, we just do a Bible study, we just open it, we don't have... This is how we do things, and you have to follow these rules. So that's the best I can do. You know, uh, Orthodox, Orthodox Church, I came out of an Orthodox Church. 
when I was a kid. I grew up in an Orthodox church. Again, the one I went to was Serbian Orthodox, so it was in a different language and just very ritualistic. Okay. Where, uh, you know, we're obviously we're not ritualistic here. Uh, same with uh, Orthodox Catholic would be very ritualistic. Lutheran, Methodist, uh, Methodists aren't always high, but Lutheran, Presbyterian, kind of high church, and, and have a liturgy they follow. Is there so, like a difference, like if, uh, so like let's say when it's time of judgment, they, um, do they still fall all into that same category? Or I, would they be? No, no, no. When we come before the Lord, there's not going to be any separation of churches. Okay. People who know him, we're all going to be one. It's not going to be. There's not going to be a Calvary Chapel in heaven. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, no, but I hope that helps because oh, yes, I, think, I think it's important that we understand just because somebody worships differently than us doesn't mean they're wrong. Okay. They just choose to worship a different way. Thank you, Thank you Pastor. Yep. Back on the topic, topic of Job, when you said about him getting a new family, did he get a new wife too because of how she reacted to the whole situation <laughs> and how, he, how she treated him, wanted him to give up on God? No, he got the same old wife. Maybe she got, maybe oh, she got renewed. That's a shame. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. He probably, he probably wanted a new wife. <laughs> That was a good question. So I have two questions. They kind of intertwine with each other. Um, so when Noah built his ark and everything, what lineage of his children did we come from? Well... The three children all survived. So I would say we came from Seth from the way I read and understand things. So. And then the other one was um, God. Uh, um, how do I put it? For the Jews, he had certain rules like you can't eat this, you can't do this. So if you are still a Jew today, do you have to abide by those rules or are they done well, it, because of the New Testament? Yeah, that's a good question. It depends. Like if, if, you're, if you're a Jew practicing Judaism, yes, you still have to follow those rules. That doesn't mean they're going to go to heaven though. Just because they're following those rules, there's only one way to heaven and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. So if they're following those rules, they're kind of following them in my mind for nothing because they're not going to achieve what they're trying to achieve. But in, when we go to Israel, Jews still follow those dietary rules. So does that help? Good. Uh, my question is about uh, Moses. Okay, he saw the promised land and he died. So did um, God leave him there or did he take him up to heaven? That's a good question. Well, God buried him. It says God buried him on a mountain where nobody could find him. So I think God left him there. Okay. I mean, here's the thing, though. I, I, I got to clarify that. Moses will go to heaven because he believed in Jesus or he believed in the coming of the Messiah. He was looking forward to what we look back at. So it doesn't mean that he died and ceased to exist. He would have been in... Uh, Abraham's bosom, where they went before Jesus came and rose. So there was a place of paradise where those who believed in Jesus, their spirits went there, not his body. So I was thinking of his body. His body was in the desert, but he did go into the presence of the Lord because he believed in the Lord, in, in the Lord okay? Hey, Pastor. Um, we had a, a, a question about the Jews today that are following the law and everything, mm -hmm. and yet we know that no one is sinless. So they can't make sacrifices because they have no temple. What are they doing to atone for their sins while they're waiting for the Messiah to come? On the Day of Atonement, I'm not sure how they 
circumvent that on the Day of Atonement. I haven't looked into it that, to that detail. I think they just, by, in a way, by faith, they're practicing the Day of Atonement because they can't do the sacrifice. And so I would say they're, they're you know, I don't want to say this in a wrong way. The Jews get real creative on how to do things that they can't do anymore. So I think they've gotten real creative on we can do this and it's like us doing that sacrifice. Does that make sense? So, but they're not, they're not sacrificing. They would love to. If they could find the ashes to the red heifer, they would be sacrificing tomorrow. So. Um, this is more like a curious question. Okay. So, um, so the lineage of Jesus is through David and all that, right? And then comes Joseph. But God um, put um, basically impregnant Mary. Right. So how does Joseph's lineage come through that when Mary was the one with, that was created? Mary's lineage also comes through David. Amen. Oh, okay. through Both of them come through David's lineage. Oh, okay. One comes down one line and one comes down another line. Did because it, in, in kings and kings, the one line is cursed because he, because he blew it. So he got cursed. That's the line of Joseph. Mary's line is the other line down through Solomon and down that way. So, so on the same question of that, so why do we focus on the, the lineage of Joseph versus well, you can focus on either one. One's in Matthew and one's in Luke. If you read the, the genealogy in those two books, they're different. After David, they become different. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we don't focus. I mean, Joseph gave him the right to the kingship. Mary gave him the original lineage going back. Oh, okay. Makes sense. So, but we can look at both. We don't focus on just the one. Yeah. Right, right, because, because he is considered his father. And my question, Pastor, is you're um, on Psalm 83 war. Do you think that's past, or do you think Israel's going to face that soon? Psalm 83? War, yeah. Did we look at that last time? Did someone bring up Psalm 83? What is that, the war? Yeah. Like, th- Amir Sarfati said that it was the previous <clears throat> war that they fought back in there in the times, but some people say that they're facing that. Pretty close. When they face the war through all fronts, or do you think that's going to be? I think it might be one of those that was a past war, and it's also a war. Well, it looks to me mostly like a past war. Is is they just read? There's places that they talk about that happened, and it could be it could be a future. But I'm I'm just reading it real quick here. There's things that are spoken of that were happening at that time. So I, I think that came up last time, and that was the first time I was kind of familiar with the War of Psalm 83. So. Good evening, Pastor. This is our first time here, so I definitely don't know oh, the answer to this question. How interesting. Um, you picked a good it, night. It is very interesting. Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, we do feel very welcome. <laughs> um, my question for you um, relates to um, what you feel is the most important vision or dream that God has given you for either your ministry or the, the life of this body here. So. Oh, that's a good question. I would say that the most important dream I have for this body and for our community is that we would do a good outreach in representing Jesus and that we would be built up and strong and be able to be light in the community that's full of darkness and that, uh, that we would conduct ourselves in a way that would bring honor and glory to Jesus. And I just, have a, I just have a desire, and my greatest desire is to teach and pour into people to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry that we can go out and be effective in our community. So does that kind of help? I don't, I don't know that I have a very specific... Thank you. Good question and welcome. Good answer. Amen. All right, we've got a question that was texted in. What does worship mean according to Scripture? 
RCC folks insist it involves sacrifice, but I haven't seen scripture to support that. Also, what's the difference between praise and worship? Well, worship is, uh, you know, I like the one term worship is kissing toward God. I kind of always think of that, that that's what we're supposed to be doing as we worship. We're showing him affection. And I believe whether we're doing that singing, whether we're doing that praying, whether we're doing that in a word, that we lift up, you know, our hearts towards God. And I think that's worship. And I always like that idea. In Psalm 2, it says, kiss the son lest he be angry. And I want to kiss the son, right? Not, oh, sorry. I don't know what that was. Not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. So, yeah, so that, and then praise is just being excited about what God's doing and, and you know, kind of lifting up our hearts and getting a little loud and a little rowdy. So, that's the third service people talking, the 11 o'clock service people. Okay, I have another question. So Moses brought the, the Jews out of Egypt and they were in... They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Did God keep them totally separate from everybody else where they wandered together by themselves? Or did they mingle with other cultures? I think they fought a couple wars. If I, if I remember, there was some wars. And then uh, well, that was during Joshua, the one. Uh, there was a lot of separation. And they were in a place where nobody wanted to be. You know, God picked a great place for them to go around in circles, you know, because it was a pretty funky area, so there weren't a lot of inhabitants anyway. Uh, it seems like people kind of mingled with them. I, 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 we read that earlier this year, but I can't picture something in my mind, so I'm not sure. But he did, during that time, he kept them pure as Israel. He didn't let them intermarry or... or intermingle that way so that part I know and they were able to go into the promised land without the other peoples following them in? correct so talking about the end times in Israel any thoughts on dispensations dispensationalism yeah I, I believe I believe I'm a dispensationalist I believe that God works in different dispensations at different times I don't believe I'm a hyper-dispensationalist. There are those who get carried away. But I do believe in dispensation. I believe, I believe that there was a time of Israel, and then there's a time of the church. And I don't think we mingle the two when we do that. I think we get messed up. I do believe when the church is taken out, God will once again be working with Israel. So does that kind of clear that up? That, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm at theologically. Good evening, Pastor. Um, this is my first time here, too. I'm with them. Oh, so well, welcome. I, I really enjoyed the worship. <laughs> but I, I, I go to a church in Canton, Ohio. I'm not from here. I'm visiting friends. And I'm on the greeters team. And one of the greeters asked a question, and nobody had the answer. I, I have thoughts about it, but he asked why Satan or the fallen angels, or de why can't they repent and have a chance for redemption? And it, then he asked for a scriptural basis, like he wanted an answer with scripture. And I'm like, I've never seen anywhere in the word that talks about that. So that's my question. Right. And, and you know, I, I don't have a scripture reference. It seems, it seems what's implied is that there was a time where angels had a choice, and once they made that choice, they were locked in, good or bad. It seems like good angels can't go bad now, and bad angels can't go good. That's what it seems implied as you go through Scripture uh, as to where they're at. But I can't give you, I, I, I don't have a Scripture, and so... Well, yeah. Right. And, and, you know, I think it does have the hardness, but it seems like, like good angels are not going to go bad according to, according to how we read things. 
and bad angels aren't going to go good. So that's all I got. Good question, though. Thank you. Hello, Pastor. My name is John. First time back in a year. Okay. I would like you to explain the... the Disposition? You said you're a dispositionalist? What dispensationalist? Yeah, sorry. What that means is that I believe that God works through certain people during certain times. So there was like the dispensation of Abraham, or before Abraham, there was the dispensation with Adam and Eve, then you had Abraham, then you had Israel, and now we have the church. And God is working in different people groups at different times. I believe he's working through the church right now is what I said. So we're in the church age dispensation. Then once the church is removed, he will work again in Israel, bringing them back to him, and that's a different dispensation. So that's what I mean by that. Hi, Pastor Pat. I'm looking I'm okay. looking at my King James Version. <laughs> no. So in the Bible, of course, reading through the Bible, I make notes as I read through. So I double-checked. And in this one, it does say the same thing. So in Psalms 51.11, it says when David was talking and he said, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I thought the Holy Spirit came after Jesus when he said he would send his helper so no, the, no, the Holy Spirit's worked through Israel, but the difference between the Holy Spirit in the church age and the Holy Spirit in that age is he would come and go. He did not, he did not indwell them. In the church age, he indwells us. Oh, okay. Thank you. You got it. All right, I got one more. Okay. Um, it's about the Sumerian woman at the well. Uh -huh. Okay, so I was just... Me and my wife were actually talking about that, me and my fiance, actually. Uh, so do you think, like, whenever he's telling her, like, you've had, you know, this many husbands already because you choose not to keep one, do you think, like, he's focusing on, like, the actual marriage, like, certificate and that, or do you think he means, like, like you've lain together, you've committed to each other, like, because, I mean, I feel like it doesn't get too into it in the Bible. I mean, I, maybe I'm just missing that. Well, yeah, he, he implies, so when he's talking to her, he says, the man you're with now is not your husband, yeah. and neither were the other five. So I think Jesus is recognizing the institution of marriage okay. at that point, and they did not go through that institution. They were living, let's use the term of today, they were living together. Yeah. And so he's calling her out on that because, she, because he recognizes the Lord recognizes the institution of marriage as some kind of ceremony and going through a ceremony that he put together. So I believe that's an important step, and I believe that's what Jesus was teaching there, that there is this institution of marriage, and you're not following that. And so what it was in their day might look different than what it is today, <clears throat> but God honors that institution and we can't make light of it or we can't change it. Does that help? Good. Oh, oh our guys are fighting. He's new. Yeah. Pastor, on Ephesians 6, Verse 12, it says, For we are not to wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of the wickedness in the heavenly places. That raises two questions, it raises two questions to me, and that is, doesn't the Bible say we should adhere to the powers that be? And the second question is, where is wickedness in holy places? Well, to me, holy places are for the righteous. Mine says heavenly places. 
Okay. Yeah, you're, you're, I'm sorry, I stayed corrected. Okay, so heavenly places doesn't mean heaven like we think of heaven where God is. Heavenly places can mean the domain of the other atmosphere, okay? So I don't think he's talking about wickedness in heaven in the presence of God. He's talking about we have, we have earth, we have sky, we have space, and we have heaven. But that's all considered heavenly places from the, the atmosphere. Are you with me? So that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about in heaven. So that answers that one, I think. So what was the other one? What did you say? It says we shouldn't fight against uh, principalities and powers that be, whereas doesn't the Bible say we should, you know, succumb it's, to the powers that be? It says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers so we don't, here's what he's saying, we don't get mad at each other. It's not a, this, this whole war is not flesh and blood. It's a spiritual war. And we're fighting a spiritual warfare. So he says principalities and powers. And then he says put on the armor of God right after that. And you put on the armor of God so that you can battle against spiritual forces. So our battle, when people do things, it's because they're, they're, uh, motivated through spiritual, and I'm not saying everybody who does something bad is, is demon-possessed, but it's, it's demonic. They're motivated by those kind of powers to do things. We need to not look so much at the physical, but look at the spirit behind it. Does that make sense? Okay. See, if you were on your side, you would have been there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think now, I know what now, Fred was trying to say. Now like, he's on your side. See? Fred, I think you I think I know what you're asking though. Like, but we are supposed to submit to authorities though, right? Like we're not supposed to go against the authority like in this scene realms like like I think that's what he was asking, is like like we're supposed to submit to authority. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I don't know where my guys, oh. Pat, I'm going to take you back to Job, if I might. Sure. 42 and um, verse 8. Now, therefore, take for yourselves, and then I'm going to jump down for your, um, uh, a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Is he a priest in the order of Melchizedek? No. But he's just acting as a priest at that point, but I don't think he's in the order of Melchizedek. I don't think it has anything to do with... Job was way before Melchizedek. Job was, Job was before Abraham. He's just at that time being appointed to serve for those knuckleheads. I just want to make a comment. I'm a big defender of women. And so I want to say this kindly, but I always feel sad when we criticize Job's wife for her comment, curse God and die. But we have to remember that she also was standing there watching her husband lose absolutely everything she lost her children, and yet she was there at the end and joined him with a new family. So all of us have moments where we want to strike out and say something, and we need to have compassion, um, not, not ridicule. Um, and one other person that that effects was um, the queen that uh, when Esther was brought in to be the new queen I can't think of the previous queen's name yeah uh, she she lost her position because she disobeyed her husband but when I read that story and how these men had been drinking for weeks 
this was not a, um, just a real nice ceremony. I mean, she was going to be out there with a bunch of guys that had been drinking and carrying on, and um, she refused to go. And so it's not, it doesn't make any difference to the gospel. I, I'm just saying that we, we uh, I'm sensitive when we feel like somebody should be uh, railroaded or criticized. All right, thank you. All right, hello, Pastor Brad. Uh, my question is in Second Samuel chapter 21. Uh, it's uh, talking about the famine during the David time. And uh, that happened because Saul killed the Gibeonites in behalf of Israelites. And to resolve the problem, the descendants of Saul had to be put on death. So how does it work in the, what's that? Satisfying the judgment of God, not contrary to the law, which is saying the sons will not die for the father's sin. Okay. Uh but wasn't David taking care of the Gibeonites? He wasn't, he wasn't holding them accountable for that sin. Is it? David gave seven descendants of Saul to Gibeonites and they killed them. So basically, yes, they were put to death. And your question is, why, why would they be put to death because of Saul? Is that your question? Yes. Uh, I would say it says it is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house. So it's because of Saul and his family. They were, they were not innocent bystanders. They were participating with Saul in coming against the Gibeonites. That's the way I read it. So that's why he would hand them over. Does that help? L a little bit? Not really, okay. That's the, way, that's the way I'm reading it right here, is it was because of his and his bloodthirsty house, which means his whole house was involved in coming against the Gibeonites. So that's why there was the retaliation. That's what I'm seeing. So, okay? All right, we've got another, another text. All right, one more and that's it. After Cain killed Abel, he left and found a wife. So, were there other cultures already in existence outside the Garden of Eden when God created Adam and Eve? No. I think there was, I think there was, uh, it said he took other wives. Yeah, I think it was still, still part of the whole Adam and Eve lineage and they had a lot of children we don't know about or that are not recorded that and yes I know they're committing incest but it was uh, accepted then because there was not very many people so that's what I believe sir one last question here okay hi uh, my name is Danny McDonald it's really good to be with you here tonight first time I've ever been here and I have a question Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and 12 or verse 11 says uh, speaking of Jesus, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And my question is, is there a place in the body of Christ in this modern time for apostles and prophets? I do not believe in the authoritative sense there is in the sense of the office of an apostle or the office of a prophet. I believe the office of apostle was fulfilled with the twelve. And then they gave the conditions, and no one can meet those conditions today. So I don't think there's that apostolic office. I think in the sense of sending out missionaries the, as apostles in that sense, sent ones, I think that happens. Like missionaries. Yeah, I believe. But I don't believe there's that apostolic office or even the office of prophet. I believe there are 
people who speak forth the word of God today, but I don't believe in that office. I believe those were done away with in that first century. And Jude tells us that, you know, the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints, and that's that, this body here that we have, I don't believe we can add to this uh, word. What about evangelists? I believe evangelists are today because they go out and evangelize. I believe in pastor teachers. So I know your question might be, why would the two not be for today? But those were gifts to God's church, and the church changes over time, and I believe those were offices that were done away with. So, you know, there's a movement. There's the new apostolic reformation movement going on today, NAR, that is so dangerous, and I think so outside of the realm of biblical Christianity that it's, to me, it's a scary, scary movement. So I don't know if that helps. And it might be your last time here, but that's okay. <laughs> Bless you, sir. Thanks for the yeah. answer. Can, can I add one more? Sure. The qualifications were you had to be in the presence of Jesus. Oh, okay. And, and that's written in the book of Acts. Okay. Hmm. All right. So, okay. All right, we good? Yes. All right, thank you guys. Hey, let's stand up and pray. Father, we do, uh, we thank you, God, that we can discuss things, we can look at things, and Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, thank you for your word, and God, I do pray that each one of us, Lord, would grow strong in you. I believe that we would be people who dig into your word to understand you because you've given us your revelation, and God, as we get ready to leave tonight, that Lord, it would be a blessed time, and that we could go and we could Rejoice in our God and rejoice in uh, walking with you, knowing you, and making you known. So thank you, God, for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.